Okay, so I'm going to go over collecting petition signatures, the instructions and the forms and all that great loveliness. So there is, let me see. So it's not March 13th, is it? Isn't that the precinct convention day? March 13th begins the 75 day period. It yeah. starts after the precinct convention. So at 9 we're March, at 9 yeah, well, at 9 but you can't date it the 13th because then they might not count it. You could be. Yeah, because they can, they can say, oh, well, you didn't do it after 9 o'clock. Right. They, so just do it March 1st. So <coughs> we've always started, because it's the day after the precinct conventions is when it starts. So it's March 14th, not the 13th. Begins 75 day period, ends May 27th, but that's a Sunday, it's Memorial Day, and so we have until, we have to turn them in on Tuesday. Um, and so for those of you who are here, um, you have this sheet that's petitioning basics that I wrote up for paid petitioners and edited it a little bit. This one is a two pager on, you know, places you can go and what you can do and what to remember to bring. And then this one is signature validity requirements. And then, of course, and ignore the yellow paper. I ran out of white. Do not print them on colored paper. Um, and this is the petition form itself. And this is prescribed by law. And it has to be this exact form. Um, some people have modified it to print on a letter size paper, but um, the, they're not very successful. There's, the blanks are too small. You can't get enough information in there. So it's legal or nothing. Um, so voters, so, okay. I'm probably not gonna go off the slideshow too much because I, I didn't prepare it. But, so on the petition, by law, you are supposed to read where it says this statement must be read to each person before signing the petition. You are supposed to read what is here word for word, okay? That's the law. Now, practically speaking, that is not how this happens. <laughs> because it, nobody's, gonna, nobody's gonna wait for you to read this to them. I think I had one person ever who wanted me to read it to them. Um, but basic, the basics are they can't have voted in the precinct, uh, the primaries, and they have to be registered to vote, and they can't have signed another petition for another party, which as far as I know right now, there are no other parties petitioning for ballot access in 2018, and um, they can't have participated in the convention of another party. So if they, for example, went to the Libertarian conventions, they can't sign our petition, right? And then that is what this says. It says, I know that the purpose of this petition is to entitle the blank party you would write in green there to have its nominees placed on the ballot in the general election for state and county officers. I have not voted in a primary election or participated in a convention of another party during this voting year. And I understand I become ineligible to do so by signing this petition. I understand that signing more than one petition to entitle a party to have its nominees placed on the general election ballot in the same election is prohibited. So what I just said in different language. Um, and it's in there, it's there in Spanish too, so that if you don't even speak Spanish, you can just read it to them. Or, and it's right there. Um, so, on the how to page, I talk about this about how to plan your efforts around uh, large public events. And the reason why if people, I tried doing block walking in, 20, in 2000. Um, and it was so slow and time consuming that it wasn't really worth the time. If you're combining it with trying to get people to come out to the precinct conventions and you're walking your own precinct, that's one thing. But if you're going for volume, you need to be somewhere like the state fair today. Like if we were petitioning, we would all be down at the state fair with six clipboards each or eight clipboards each and collecting hundreds of signatures in hours, right? That's what you want to plan around. 
So there is, uh, the Ballot Access Committee did start a calendar um, for events, for petition gathering. And so um, that would be the place to check and reference and put up information now, like things that, for example, in Austin, South by Southwest happens in the middle of petition drive. So if you want to collect petitions, let's send a whole bunch of people there. Now, granted, there are a lot of out of state people who come to South by Southwest. So there's that. But there are a lot of Texans who come as well. Um, there's a Con Street Festival that happens in May. That's a lot of out of town people too, or out of state people too, but it still has a large volume of locals. Um, so you want to think about now events to put on the calendar for that time period that you know of, like reggae festivals used to be in the spring, sometimes now they're in the fall, which kind of sucks, but art those park. were really good. The Art Car Parade in Houston is a fabulous venue, uh, rodeos, um, I know, but rodeos have a lot of people who would sign petitions um, before or after, more preferably after a music concert or event where there's a large number of people. Just think about things like that that you know are going on during those time periods because they happen every year and um, go through that. So petition procedures. <coughs> So, okay, so you go out, you collect these signatures, and everybody pretty much understand what they have to do when you go do this. Like you take the petition signatures, the petition out, you ask people, hey, would you, do you want more choices on the ballot? Will you sign this petition to put the Green Party on the ballot? Did you vote in the primary? Yes or no, if they say no, are you registered to vote? Well, you can say, are you registered to vote first? But if you go around saying, hey, are you registered to vote? They think you're registering voters and they will ignore you. Right? Do never leave, never leave with that. Um, so you want to, so you go through the process. They say they sign it, right? They sign this petition. You get it back and you immediately make sure you can read it, right? You want to be able to make sure you can read their name, you can read their address, and they have to put their residence address on that list that says no PO boxes. PO boxes are not sufficient. Business addresses are not legitimate. They have to be the address where the person is registered to vote. Whatever's on their voter ID. Yeah, whatever's on their voter registration card. And um, the city is required. The zip is not required. However, the zip has to be there for you to verify the signatures. So always make sure you have the zip code. Make sure you can read the address. The county, of course, you can write that in. Um, and sorry, let me backtrack. You can write in everything for them, but they have to sign it, right? So you can write in their address, you can write in the county, you can write in a date of birth. They just have to sign it. Um, the counties, you can always go back and fill those in later. If you at least have their street address, you can always look up the zip code. Um, and then these last two fields are voter registration number and date of birth. One or the other has to have one or the other. 99% of the people do not carry their voter registration card and will not know their VUID. It's called a VUID on the card. It says VUID does not say voter registration number. That's the number that goes here. And if they don't have that, I think I met one person out of like 10,000 that I talked to that knew their number by heart. Um, yeah, right. And they, so if they don't have their voter card or don't know their number, they have to give you their date of birth. And it has to be accurate, right? Because we're looking at their registrations. We have to make sure these people are voters. So when they, when they fill it up, make sure you have their date of birth, their address, and you can read it and their name and there's a code and you're good. So once you've filled out your petitions, up here in the top corner it says name of circulator. You should put your name there. Do not, under any circumstances, get this notarized before you finish this verification process, okay? You can't, oh, I got 500 sheets of paper, <coughs> go get them notarized and then go verify them because the notarization means that you already did that, right? And so you're, that's, you could be charged with a crime, okay? 
So you get your petitions, you gather them all up, you make sure it's legible, and then you, so on the signature validity at the top, this is the current website where you can look up voter registration. And you need, um, you need the zip code, you need the date of birth, and you need the name and the county. That's what you need to look it up. And so when you look it up, it'll tell you their address, it'll tell you their voter, voter registration number. And what we, we have always done is, as we're looking them up, we write in the VUIDs, right? Yeah. So then you have both the date of birth and the VUID, we've verified them. And every once in a while, you'll get one that you can't find anywhere, it's in uh, illegible, or some bogus information, obviously, like I had somebody write in some stupid stuff like they were Mickey Mouse or something. And like, so you know that's a bogus signature. The best thing to do is to take a marker and, and black it out. So that because what can happen, depending on who checks them at the Secretary of State's office, if there's one invalid signature on that sheet, they can throw out the whole sheet. So you want to make sure that you've validated everything and that if there's something that's completely bogus, cross it off. Um, Travis? They've written their date of birth. What is the point of writing in their VUID? The point is, is that we verified it and we know that that's a valid signature. And so it's just, the Secretary of State, it's faster for them to look up the VUIDs than it is to look up the voter by name because they have to put in all that stuff that you have to put in, right? So basically, and that, this is required by law, you're supposed to verify all these signatures as valid. It makes it harder for them to accuse us of not having verified. It makes it harder for them to say you didn't verify it and therefore committed a crime. It makes it easier for them to verify our signatures and therefore we find out faster. It also makes it easier for them and they don't hate us so much. Because can you imagine having to do this for a job? <laughs> um, so, and so, okay, so you've done all that, right? And so there's two ways you can notarize this. The first way is my favorite way is, see where it says name of circulator and there's a blank and it says page blank of blank. If you put your name there, and you can just put your first name or whatever, and then you put page one of, say you have 50 sheets, and you do one of 50, two of 50, three of 50, and number them all the way up to 50 of 50, then, and you staple them together, then all you have to do is notarize this one top page, and all 50 of those are valid. But you have to number them, and have your name filled out properly, and then, and stapled together. And then you can just do the one top page notarization. If you don't do all of that, you have to do it page by page. So you would have to get 50 notary stamps, okay? The notary is gonna hate you. <laughs> so the best thing to do is to bundle your petition signatures. You can do whatever pack fits in the staple you have, right? 25 or whatever. Bundle them up, get them each notarized that way. I don't think I've ever done more than 50 in a bundle, personally. Um, and then you have to take it to a notary, and they fill out all this down here, and you sign it, they sign it. Um, yeah, and put their title and their seal and everything. And so it's really important that at least one person in every county that's doing this becomes a notary. You need, the best thing to do is to have a Green Party person who is notary so that A, you can get it done for free, and B, you have somebody you can rely on to be there when you need them last minute. Because the night before, there's always that last minute getting stuff together, and if you've got a notary on hand, you don't have to worry about anything. And I think Harris County's always had one, Dallas County's always had one, uh, Bear County always had one, so that we just didn't have to think twice about it. Allison? My mother is a notary. Would it be okay for me to get her to notarize them? Yes. Okay. If you know somebody who's a notary, then and they're willing to do it, mm -hmm. 
then absolutely. And also family members, they have to be careful with family members. Um, as notaries, you're not supposed to notarize. It's it's not illegal, but it's considered highly unethical Ethical. Yeah. for a family member to notarize another member's um, papers. Like I was a notary. This is not my papers. Right. No, 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 they're saying anything. Yeah. They're just they're just recommending for notaries not to do that because I didn't notarize my ex-husband's mm -hmm. um, petitions because mm -hmm. we didn't want it to be a conflict of interest. Okay. So there'll, there'll be notaries available. Like once okay. the petition drive starts, there'll be a lot of notaries around. Yeah. So yeah. So what Joy's saying is, if your mother is a notary, don't have her notarize your petitions, but she can notarize everybody else. Okay. So when yeah. I pick up, right? Is and um, and also like. If you're a member of a credit union or a bank, they'll oh, yeah. notarize for free yeah. as many times as you want. Uh, Laura? But the circulator needs to sign in front of the notary, so you can't pick up and take them, right? Okay. What do you mean? Does not the circulator need to complete this in, and sign in front of the notary at the bottom, the bottom statement? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Well, yeah, so what she's yeah. saying is I could pick up somebody else's and have yeah. my mother notarize oh, somebody no, else's. No, 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 the no, circulator no. must be there to I'm sign in front of the notary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah. you circulate this petition, you get it notarized. Right. You cannot right. give this petition to somebody else and have them notarize it without you present or you can't give it to them and you can't give it to them and have them notarize it as if they were the circulator. Right? Okay. Uh, Kevin. Okay, now suppose that you uh, get somebody to sign and it turns out that they're not, uh, it's not a valid uh, person, you know, that they don't, they're not registered or whatever. Uh, you, what do you what do you do? I mean, like you've got ten signatures, but one of them is bad. cross it out with a black marker. Okay. If you're validating and one of them comes across and they're not a registered one voter, I think one line. Just one make line. one line, yeah. cross it off with a black marker, and that way the Secretary of State know because you're signing down here that. I verified each signer's registration status and believe the signature is genuine and corresponding blah, blah, blah. So you are swearing, right, that you verified this. And if you know they're not registered to vote because you couldn't verify it, cross it off. Um, and there is, okay, so there is a, it says see instructions on back. Um, we have found in practice, well, one, it's not required to be printed on there to be a valid petition. Um, so what we found the best thing to do is to have one instruction page you put on the back of your petition board in case somebody wants to read it or in case you need to read it. Um, and it and it tells you basically everything I just told you. Well, not everything, but part of what I just told you. So that you have it, I would have one on the back of my board, but I would not print the back of all of them because it's, it's a waste of toner um, and time and it's not required. Um, we did try doing double-sided sometimes, but it really only works if you have really thick paper because of the bleed through and the Secretary of State's office does not like it. So, sorry, waste, the, you gotta kill the trees unless you wanna buy hemp paper or something. Um, so, where are we? No rising. Verifying, I think. So we went over the verifying. Does anybody have any questions about verification or notarization? Travis? Um, on all the little blanks here, are you, is the, the, the circulator filling out everything except the bottom middle and bottom right, and those are filled out by the notary? Um, actually, you do not fill out anything below this black line here, where it says affidavit of circulator, that is filled out by the notary. <coughs> that entire bottom section okay. is filled out by the notary. So you so, just put green <laughs> on this first blank? Like a, right, the first blank would say green, the second pl blank would say verde. Okay. And then uh, your name here and the page okay. numbers here, and then the signatures, okay. and that's it. And then the notary does the bottom part. Um, 
Um, oh, so if you look at the validity requirements, um, I think I've gone over some of these. Make sure you date every signature, but you can use ditto marks. So like, say you're at a festival, right? And you put the date here and you can put ditto marks on the other nine. You don't have to rewrite the date. Um, and you can go back later and do the ditto marks if it's missing or write in the date. Um, abbreviations are fine as long as it's ascer reasonably ascertainable. Um, for example, in San Antonio, everybody writes SA. That's fine. Houston, HOU is fine. Um, street does not have to be written out, you know, ST. Um, you can make corrections. We found that using the correction tape was much better than trying to use the liquid. Um, it just works better. Um, but you can, like, say you look up somebody's registration and they had the wrong address, just change it. Put their address where they're registered because you, you know that that's that person. Um, I mean, because you can verify the date of birth and you verify that they live in the same county and you verify their name. It's probably the same person. They just forgot they changed their registration or they didn't change their registration or whatever. So you can make corrections if they put the wrong information, but and you verify that that's the right person. Um, people put the wrong zip code on their own address. Like yeah. Literally, like they had the wrong zip code and they lived there. Yes, so people put the happens. wrong zip code. Yeah, it happens. You know, because they were thinking something different, whatever. Or I've had people put the wrong county, and so I had to correct the county. Um, like I said before, zip code's not required, but it is what you use to verify it. Um, and most, and the information on this sheet came from Stace Vandersek at the Elections Division of Secretary of State in 2000, but none of it has changed. There have been no changes whatsoever to the form or the instructions um, since then. Um, let's see. Oh, and like, say somebody, like, you've got a couple and they live at the same address, if they put their address and the next person puts ditto marks, that's legitimate. You don't have to rewrite it. You could, but you don't have to. Um, oh, and you do not need to be a voter to circulate this petition. Yes. Okay? You don't even have to be a citizen. Right. You don't even have to be 18. My 12-year-old brother in 2000 collected petition signatures, and he was really good because mm -hmm. they were, he was a kid, and they were, he was talking about politics, and adults were just entranced. And they, it was a great gimmick, right? Um, but he wanted to help out. So he actually went with me to Indiana, and we petitioned in Indiana when he was 12. So you can be a child and put, circulate petitions. You can be... A, you can be an undocumented citizen, or you can, well, I guess you're not an undocumented <laughs> citizen, but you can be an undocumented resident and circulate petition signatures. So if you have people who can't vote but want to participate in the process, this is a great way to get them involved because all you have to do to notarize down here is to have some form of identification. And for people under 18, like they have special, like they can use school IDs, I think, and especially if the notary knows you then it's there like that's one of the things that a notary can vouch for like yes i know this person and they signed it and they don't have to have a, a identification um i think that's all in the validity stuff so um a lot of times people have turned in petitions without out validating them and this is where the party has to take up the, the, the job of checking them, right? That's why it's good to write in the BUID so that when you turn them into your county chair or whatever, they can go, oh, look, these, these have all been verified. They look clean. But if they're not clean, if they look like a mess, like somebody just collected some signatures, didn't do a, pay a lot of attention, got them notarized and gave them to you, which happens a lot, then the party has to go through and check them. So we have to have volunteers. And in fact, when petition companies do this, they have circulators and verifiers. So they have people who go out and circulate, and then they have people who actually verify them. And you pay for verification. 
you pay an added cost. So you pay for the circulation and then you pay for the verification. <coughs> um, that is standard in the petition industry. Um, so everybody's got a pretty good understanding of the petition itself. Do I need to go any more into that? All right, then I do want to point out a couple of things. So this is just more about logistics and stuff. If you look at the how to petitioning for ballot access, there's some things like what to wear, where to go, um, how to approach people. And I don't know if we were planning on doing that. I, I did not prepare to do like a um, role play thing. But I did come prepared and to show you what I did and how I did this. So I have, well one, how I'm dressed. I've got, I've got cargo pants on. I can put stuff in my pockets. I've got a waiter's belt thing that's ah. got three pockets in it. Um, I'm dressed comfortably. I've got my green party t-shirt on. Now we're going to be, this is going to be hot. So the odds of me needing to wear something like this are slim to none. Yeah. But you want to be easily identifiable. You're going to be in the heat. And quite honestly, this is too much clothing for me for doing this in the summertime. I would be wearing shorts instead. Yeah. Um, I, unless you're going to be inside, but the odds of that happening are slim to none. Um, but if you're going to go out into a neighborhood or you're going to go out into a crowd, you need to have something on that identifies you as doing something. So I look like a can person, <laughs> right? I look like I'm going to go door to door or working. I'm not just some random person. Now, for the art car parade and the King William Fair and places where people dress up and do stuff like that, I wore a Wonder Woman costume to King William Fair to petition to attract attention. So, do I? One time, I had I went to um, Kerrville Folk Festival and had a big uh, stick with a sign on it that said "Sign My Ballot Access Petition." And I, it had some other weird saying on the back of it. And just so that people saw that, they didn't see me. And so people were asking me what I was doing. Um, whatever you can do to draw a good attention to yourself is a good thing. Um, we also found these clipboards suck. <laughs> yeah, the yeah. worst. You cannot carry enough of these to get to be effective okay but you can get this material from the like off, um, what do you call those places the office supply store no not office supply store office supply store is not what i'm talking about i'm talking about like home hardware, Depot, hardware, hardware store, store hardware craft, store craft thank stores. you hardware <laughs> stores you can buy this material in big sheets and if you're Joy, you get Lowe's to cut it for you. Yeah, they, Lowe's and, will cut it for you, but you probably have to call a manager. And yeah, because they don't want to make that many cuts. Yeah, but we, do it. we do did it. these at home. Nicholas, who has since passed, made all these boards. And I still have some in San Antonio. I didn't think to grab them. This was our first prototype. It was a cheaper um, board, and it... it um, we ended up getting a board that's exactly like this, and it was nicer. And what we ended up doing was punching holes in it with the drill press and tying a string so we could tie the pens to them because <coughs> pens walk like lighters. Mm -hmm. And so um, <laughs> these are great. I would carry eight of these to an event myself. And the deal is, is you have eight boards, right? You have two people who stop, you get them to sign, they're signing. You've got more people coming at you. You've got six boards left. You can get more people signing. So you've got these two people signing, you're talking to these people, you get four people to sign. Then you still got two more boards, you can get more people to sign. So you can have eight people signing, and especially in crowds where like people are traveling in crowds, 
Like they don't have to wait on each other to finish signing. Yep. You may get one out of if you only have two of these, you're gonna lose you're people. gonna lose so many signatures just because you're not well prepared. So this was an ingenious thing that we came up with. I don't even remember what oh six, oh four. I mean and it was so effective. It it doubled my productivity easily. Yeah. Just make you don't sure carry multiple clipboards. You're not. You're wasting time. Yeah. Just make sure nobody walks off with your signatures. Yeah. That's another. Thing. I have yeah. never had that happen, but um, they accidentally just walk away. They don't mean to. They just yeah. walk, walk away. Especially if you're at like a Marley festival or something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. But uh, yeah, you want to make sure you get your pens back, your things back. So you do have to kind of keep track of a lot of stuff going on. And it's really good to do this with more than one person so that one, when those people who come and yell at you or say some really horrible shit to you, you can take a break and go talk to somebody you know is not going to yell at you. <laughs> and and also, so you can like have each other's back. Like we would do it like where I would be like handing out boards to people, and the other person I was working with was like, I don't know what to do. And so I would just start taking their boards away from them, like giving them people, and just be like, okay, you. Like, I would have them just collect them, and I would be soliciting, right? Mm -hmm. Because not everybody has the ability to overcome whatever it is they need to overcome to solicit this signature gathering. But they can be your backup, right? They can be making sure that people fill them out properly. They can be collecting them so that you don't lose something. And they can be going and getting things for you, like water and snacks and food and stuff like that. I'll show you one other board I did. So there's only one of these in existence that I know of. And Nick made this for me because I, I carried a petition with me everywhere I went and everybody should. You can fold this up like this and put it in your pocket, put it in your purse, and you have at least one paper with you at all times. Everywhere I went, I had a piece of paper. I didn't like carrying the big boards all the time, especially for certain things. So he made me out of an old 2000, eight by, four by eight corrugated plastic board. He cut it down to a legal size board and then split one side of it so I can fold it up. And then all you have to do, so you have your petition on there. It's folded up. You're carrying it around. It's much easier to get around. It's really light. And then when somebody wants, and when you want to use it, you just put the binder clips over the fold on both sides. And now it won't bend. And so you've got a portable board. I think I've had this since 2004. And I still use it for sign-in sheets if we go to an event or something and I need to be portable. Um, those are the... <coughs> oh. Rubber bands. Pens. Binder clips. Flyers. You need to have your tools with you. You need to have enough petition sheets so that you're out. You don't run out of sheets while you're out. I was going to say put it on a nice bag, but this bag broke on me on the way up here. <laughs> so make sure you have a good sturdy bag to keep your stuff in. Make sure you have water, sunscreen, hats, buttons to identify yourself, the Green Party, shirts if you have them. And, and so when I was out, I was pretty self-contained. I would have flyers in a pocket, all my boards in my hands, and pens, and spares, and spare rubber bands. In fact, I put several rubber bands on each side so that one breaks, no big deal. Um, and you just need to be prepared because you don't want to run out of sheets, you don't want to run out of pens, you don't want to run out of rubber bands while you're out working because you could potentially lose 
two, three hundred signatures just because you didn't tell the fair joint and Travis? One thing you didn't mention, you need to have your lawyer's phone number in case someone tries to arrest you while you're petitioning. <laughs> you need to have your lawyer's phone number written on your arm in okay. case you get arrested. I need to go through that whole thing. Oh, thank I'm, you for okay. No, that's thank you for reminding okay. me. Okay. What do you do with the binder? Oh. It, instead of rubber bands. Just you can use the rubber you can use binder clips to hold them on the boards. Either one. Rubber bands or binder clips. Um, they both work just fine. Um, okay, so legality issues. Thank you, Joy. So there the Jehovah Witnesses had set the precedent in the Supreme Court case that I cannot remember the name of, but you have the right to petition. And they on public land. Okay, that means sidewalks, but you cannot obstruct the sidewalk. You can stand on the sidewalk as long as you're not blocking people from walking down the sidewalk. You can be in a public park. You can be um, outside a library, outside a post office. Um, I have these, they're on here. On the how-to sheet, it tells you a bunch of different places. Um, that are public space somewhere. Anyway, anything that's like, like city city hall is a public place. Um, DPS stations. Malls are not <coughs> public <coughs> space. Dart is not a public space either, but that's where we used to petition a lot. Is on the Dart train stations. They're great, but if they kick you out, they have the right to kick you out. Really? Yeah, because it's public private. It's a public-private joint venture, so they won't oh, let us. Oh, yeah. So we petition on the fly. We petition on the train, though. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So the, the, yeah. So the distinction right. is fully public places like public libraries are fair game. Public-private partnerships like DART here in, in uh, Dallas is a public-private partnership. Malls are a public-private partnership, basically, even though they're fully private. Mm -hmm. But... Um, Grocery stores, all of these places are not public property and they can kick you off out. <clears throat> so there are several ways to go about it. Um, some places will give you permission and you just get permission and do what they tell you to do and don't violate whatever they tell you not to do so you don't get kicked out. Like the food co-op where I live, you have to get authorization to petition outside and you can't approach people they can come up to you and ask you what you're doing but you can't talk to them unless they talk to you first so it's not really a great place to petition um, <clears throat> or you can do what I always did and I would go places where there were a lot of people and if a security officer gave me a hard time and it was a private place like a parking lot for a grocery store or a mall or whatever I was just be like, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know, and I would leave. But I, they weren't going to give me permission, right? But I went and worked it until I got kicked out. And that's usually the best way to do it. You're not going to, I mean, if you argue with them and you're not in a public place, you're not going to get anywhere except maybe jail. And no lawyer is going to take that case. Right, no lawyer is going to help stupid. you. It's, now, if you're standing outside this library on public space and you're not blocking anybody from going in and out or blocking the sidewalk and they start harassing you, then that's where you want your lawyer's phone number. That's like, when you want to get arrested for the lawsuit. Yeah. Yeah, for the you lawsuit. You get arrested and, you know, then there's a great lawsuit. Um, because there's, there's federal precedents about this, right? This is fully legitimate, legal... Supreme Court says that you have the right to do this. I don't know if anybody has gotten arrested. Do you? Um, no, but we were threatened with arrest multiple times. Um, I got threatened um, by a cop at a public place. <coughs> sure. Yeah, I've been threatened. I mean, the cop was like, "We're gonna arrest you if you don't leave," and I'm like, "I don't have a lawyer, so mm -hmm. I guess I'll leave." You yeah, know, what I mean, I just didn't have anyone. Okay. I I, I'll get to you in just a second, Raquel. Um, so yeah, you. I've been hurt. Uh, same thing. I've been told multiple times by police that I couldn't stand on the sidewalk out of the way and like petition, and I just argue with them because I knew what the law was, and they usually let you give up and go away. 
but if you don't want to argue with the cops, just, you, just leave and come back later. You know, it's it's not <laughs> it's not that big a deal. Um, but most cops don't know the law either, right? This right. rent is just all a crime. So, uh, Ra Rachel. So this um, this brings me pause. This whole conversation makes me uncomfortable because um, people of color usually don't get the liberties that other people yeah. get. Yeah. So I just Absolutely. Want to, I don't really want to feel as though that is a slighted comment. It's just the truth. So when you start asking about, by the time, whoop, whoop, you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you can hear it, you're gone. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So what what I what I want to do is propose maybe with that in mind, how um, everyone can still participate. And what I'm what I think I'm hearing is just register. Those that don't want to give you permission, do something different. Those that if you're on public property, it might be good to register with <coughs> you. You know, even if I do have a lawsuit and I get arrested and I'm found to be innocent and I can press charges, by the time I get to that whole thing, they have so disrupted my family and my life that I just don't want to do it for the green party. Mm -hmm. I, I don't. I, I just don't want to go. I don't look good in orange and I'm going to be somebody's bitch because I don't like it. So what, what, I, what I think we need, I don't know because I've never done this before, but there's got to be some practicality that yeah. avoid the police situation as much as possible. Thank you for bringing that up. If you're white, these rules apply to you. If you're not white, no, it's, so <laughs> no, it's no, but it's it's different. No. It's totally different. And I and I'm sorry I didn't point that out. What we what you can set up like you can ask permission. Like Whole Foods, for example, we asked permission. They gave us permission. Really? The cops aren't going to harass you in San Antonio. Oh, okay. In San Antonio, they gave us permission. So if you want to make sure that you're covered and don't want to deal with police confrontation, then the thing to do is to talk to where you're going and get permission from the management. Once the management says you're good and somebody says something to you, be like, well, the man go talk to the manager yeah. and come back with go. I'll go get the manager and we can talk to them. You know, whatever makes you feel uncomfortable. Is there some kind of form? Because I'm a safety gal and I want to say, hey, can I come between 9 and 12? And if they say yes, say, I, I would like you to sign it. So I'll just fax it over. If you can fax it back, that would be wonderful. My volunteers will be there. We'll leave on time. And we will do I, I'm an organized person like that. So that Yeah, I'll there's no like set so it's form. That I can just yeah, you can make up something or you can ask them, be like, can you give me something in writing to say I have permission to do this? Um, and, you know. It's not that difficult. I just want to make sure. Yeah, there's no official form and there's no way to register with the city, right? You can't go to the city and get a permit to do this. The, because it's your first amendment. Because it's your first amendment, right? There is no permit process, right? There's no registration process. I, that doesn't exist anywhere in the United States, as far as I'm aware. But if, but if I find a public spot, mm -hmm. then I really don't have any protection except to tell the police officer it's my first amendment right to be. Yeah, yes. and actually, we sh I, to the judge kind of? he pretty much. Yeah. But okay. but there is there is um I I'm sorry they're not on here. I these were. These were written before my time, and I just edited them. But there is a specific case okay. that had to do with the Jehovah's Witness that set the precedent for allowing this to happen. And if um, I'm sure we can find that case and have it in the information packet, so and we carry it in the position, and you can carry it, it with you. Yeah. If, 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 and I, if a police officer comes up, the bottom line. I don't have a police officer on his, I mean, I don't have a, a, what do you call it, an attorney on his team, and now I have to bond out. So there, there has to be something that we do talk about, because some police officers are really good police officers, and some Absolutely. are not. And so I don't care the, how much you have a case, you go downtown and tell yeah. the Well, the, but actually, that can be all avoided. All you have to do, and all anyone's ever had to do, is if a cop comes and says, you can't do that here. You go, oh, okay, sorry. Okay, but, what, but the reality of the situation that I'm trying to get you to see is that police officers do not tell that to people of color. When uh, the police officers are called, it's never, well, I mean, I'm just 
be frank, okay, I'm being hypothetical. It usually is not, you can't do that here. What's usual is, we had a call about you harassing people. Yeah. It comes in a different form. Mm -hmm. So what I would like to talk about is that if you go to jail, here are the preliminaries that you should have lined up because there is this small possibility that this could happen. So do you know a bondsman? If not, give a call. I, I just think- I'm gonna let to Joy address it because she's- Okay, I'm actually a legal observer with a-, a And I think I emailed you, so I I'm not, I'm not a, and I'm not a lawyer. Okay, so what we do for petitioning um, we will have usually, at least in Dallas, we made sure we had attorneys from the ACLU that we could call and be like, hey, they're harassing me. What am I, can you come down here or I think they're going to arrest me? We, we're not going to send people out on petition without a lawyer. You've got to have a person. It didn't send people out in protest. Okay, you've got to have a lawyer. So we would have, the Greens would have those lawyers available, like on, like, for, for, for Okay, so if, if that's the case, then that's a conversation we're having. Mm -hmm. If you tell me that we need 47,000 petitions, that means I'm, that means we do need to have that conversation. Some people may have to have a little card because it is a possibility. Absolutely. So if it is a possibility, then maybe generally when we do another one of these trainings, say, look, guys, this never happens. And since this never happens, we're, not, we're gonna spend five minutes on it <laughs> and we're gonna move on. But there is a small percentage. When you're talking about securing 47,000 signatures, it is a conversation worth having. Is all I'm saying about it. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, what I said. that's how we prepare yeah. for it. And then there's okay. also the well, So one. when you say that's how we prepare for it, did you mean to prepare for it today to have this conversation in the training about the ACLU? Do you know the numbers of the ACLU? Do we have these, uh, since we're gonna be doing this petition drive, do we already know the name of these um, attorneys? Now, so, the attorneys that, that for, at least for Dallas County, the attorneys were, I was the vice president of the ACLU at the time in Dallas. Okay. So I made sure that our attorneys were on board with this. Like so, you got to talk to your local ACLU. So what I'm saying is, when we have these trainings and these discussions, this is a conversation that we really need to have because it is a possibility. Or we need to say we need to color coordinate. African Americans, you can't petition. <laughs> Caucasian Americans, you can't. You can't say that either. So what, 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 yeah. what, 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 what <laughs> for protection, protection. Yes. what I'm saying is Absolutely. it is a conversation yes. worth having. So in these trainings, we do need to talk about, okay, if you were green of color, you know, of so you, if you were green of color, and, and this is just in 2017 what's happening in our country. This is nobody's fault. We don't believe anybody is gonna go out looking for a fight, but there are some realities so that if these things happen, then this is the protocol. Please don't make them happen because we don't want to go to jail and we don't want to bail you out. But but there needs to be a protocol. And if we see that people are resistant or hostile, then we need to ask them to do something else other than petition. Because it's not, you know, it takes a certain kind of to make sure we don't have a lawsuit. Sure, but here, here's the thing also with the lawsuit. With a ballot access lawsuit, it's something they'll be waiting for. Like, we are waiting for someone to get arrested. So that we can, white person. We, yeah, no, no, not a person of color, for sure. We need a white person to get arrested that has money. That has money. But the ACLU will, should help because they, they're, they're, they're waiting for this. Before this petition sure. starts, before we, before we even start this, I don't know if there's going to be a training, I don't know. But these things need to be in place and be in line so that. Right, like basically you want the, uh, the right. attorneys need to come and talk to each county. Yeah, that's, like, and that's something that can be And, and, and because, how, because we're running out of time, I'm going to cut you off. But, um, so yeah, I didn't prepare for that today because this is just the basics okay. on this stuff. It's not like an actual training training. So, um, <laughs> but when we get to that point, yeah, we need to have like, here's who you're gonna call if you get arrested and here's how to avoid getting arrested. Yeah, and, and there you go. You know, right. cause yeah. that's, and yes, the situation is now different, right? I know that there's always been police brutality and all that, but we've been doing that. We've done five petition drives and we've never had anyone arrested or, or beat or anything. It did, and they're not all white, right? We've had Asian people and Mexicans and black people. But it is definitely a conversation that needs to have during the training. And it is definitely a situational, circumstantial sort of thing. And it also is a personality thing, right? Like, I can get all confrontational up in the face of a cop and they're most likely not gonna do something. 
but it still scares the shit out of me, but I'm not going to take some shit, right? But I have that privilege because of the skin color. But I would not expect anybody else to do that, right? So, yeah, that is definitely part of, and I've written it on here that I need to add it to the, the basic information. Um, we have like half an hour for you to be out of here, I believe, but I need to hit three quick things. Do not get involved in long political discussions. If some you are working, if somebody says something, be like, I'm sorry, I'm working, I have to move on. And I've never gotten anybody got mad at me about that. Um, you want to not spend more than two minutes on a person, and even that is a long period of time, because how many people were walking by you in that 30 seconds that you're talking to somebody? Um, if you're at an event and you can have a table, have somebody at the table and direct people there if they want to talk. Because you're out there getting signatures, send them to the table for information. Um, it's good to have a, a sign-in sheet kind of thing with you too. Um, if you're at an entrance to an event, make sure that you've covered all paths in there and you're not just standing next to each other because there's usually more than way, one way in and you want to spread out and make sure you cover all entrances and exits um, so that you don't miss people. And then um, if you have a table, or even if you don't, like those white voter registration cards that you mail in, or if you're a VDR, you can carry the voter registration with you, but make sure you have voter registration information either on you or at a table. <coughs> and um, they cannot, even if you're a VDR and you register them, which is a voter deputy registrar, and you register them and you give them that little thing, then they're not eligible to sign that petition that day. Okay, yeah, they because they're not technically registered for 30 days. Yes. Now, you can go back and find that person in 30 days and get them to sign it, <coughs> but that's, um, but, but it's still, you're still registering people to vote and that's always yeah. a good thing and blah, blah, blah. Um, does anybody have any quick questions before we wrap this up? Kevin? Um. Is there uh, anything that has actually been done in terms of pre-assembling lists of people to contact or having uh, some kind of organizational way of doing this rather than just calling people on the street? We do have a page on the website where people can pledge not to vote in the primaries. and either come to a precinct convention or sign the petition. Um, that's actually the first time we've done that um, ahead of time, I believe. And uh, Laura, do you want to add? Well, I just, I put that pledge to sign the 2018 ballot access petition. I put it up sort of on a, on a, a, a spur the day after election day when we lost our ballot access while hoping that it might capture a little bit of energy for some people who are like, we will ride again. <laughs> you know? so, and we have about 2,000 people who, who signed it. So that is, you know, a, a little bit of a chunk. And in trying to promote this event and everything, uh, we included the announcements, like we know you're interested in Green Party ballot access, so you may be interested in knowing that we're doing this event and trying to train for it. So. Uh, I think it would be great for us to continue to cultivate that. Um, I, Do you guys have voter rolls of who voted for the Green Party? With Jill last year? You have no idea who voted in the general for whom. It Only is impossible to say who voted for Jill Stein because that information is not gathered because your vote is secret. So as for the voter rolls, they are not really helpful because the time that you're going to spend trying to figure out where all those people are and go and find them, it's not an effective use of time when you're dealing in about 75 days. If we had six months to petition, then yeah, let's go find all the people who never vote in the primaries and go knock on their doors. But that's not a logistical reality when you only have 75 days. So it's, it is, I mean, we've tried. Right, and it's just not effective. What's effective is going to huge crowds and getting as many as possible. 
But if, as an independent candidate, though, the, the walking is okay. But because that you're, you're going to your district and you're right. knocking on doors of voters, it's actually a good tool for it's, the candidate on, at the 500 signature level. If you're doing the independent mm -hmm. petitioning, which um, quite honestly, independent, Texan, indie te independent Texans are the source for the best information for independent candidate petitioning. Uh, Linda Curtis started the organization and she is the petition queen. In fact, I think that's her email. She <laughs> has been doing independent petitioning and um, ballot initiative petitioning for 35 years in Texas. And she knows her stuff. Um, and so I would talk to her, but it's the same, the petition's slightly different, but it's pretty much the same rules. Um, whereas also like, so say you're an independent candidate running for whatever office, you can, uh, somebody can sign both a Green Party petition and your petition for independent candidacy. They cannot sign your opponent's petition for the same office, but they can also sign another independent candidate's for a different office. And it gets a little, it, that starts getting confusing to people. But um, yeah, if you're doing a small signature collection, like when I ran for city council, I collected petitions in lieu of a filing fee. And I just walked around my neighborhood and knocked on every single door and talked to every single person. And that's absolutely a good way to do it. And if you are a candidate or you're working on a campaign, then incorporating the petition into your block walking is mandatory, right? Like you should not be block walking without a petition in your hand if you're block walking during that process. Um, it's, so, and that's independent Texans? Independent Texans. In IndieTexans.org, I think. I think. Travis? If, if we come across someone who's like super enthusiastic, then do you, um, in addition to getting their signature for uh, ballot access, what's <laughs> the best way to like, you know, also bring them into the fold and get them further involved? Give them a bunch of blank sheets. <laughs> Um, get their contact information, follow. follow up with them, get them to join you petitioning. Um, that's, I mean, because everybody you bring in, it means you're multiplying your factor, right? So, I have one or two extra boards that are signing the sheets. Actually, just put them on the back. Like, you have your petition on this side, yeah. you have a sign up sheet yeah. on the back. That's what we yeah, we carry sign up sheet. And <coughs> yeah, you've got to have. The, and if you happen to forget one, just make a little mark next to their name on your petition sheet and like write their phone number on the back of the sheet or something. There's, there's always a way, right? You just want to make sure you get the contact information that they're going to respond to, whether that's phone number, email, social media, whatever. Anything else? Did I cover everything you wanted? Okay.